the daddy framework analysis phase. The analysis phase of a challenging problem is where we start to surface the details necessary to fully understand and achieve your desires. As the name blatantly suggests, this phase focuses on analyzing the relevant information of your undertaking. This begs the question, what should be analyzed? I could provide detailed definitions of several areas that should be analyzed, but it would never be comprehensive depending upon this precise application. Basically, the more detail that is provided in a model, the narrower its application and relevance become. While creating the United States, our founding fathers had the foresight to predict this dilemma. When defining our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they compromised with the Bill of Rights. It provided just enough detail to ensure that all the major categories were covered without falling into the trap of providing a laundry list. Having just persevered through the tyranny of being lowly colonists in a monarchy, they could have created an encyclopedia of rights. The right to sleep in on the weekends, the right to put your feet up on the coffee table, the right to watch bad kung fu movies, the right to eat chocolate ice cream. They realize that this comprehensive approach assumes the risk of omission. Do I have the right to eat vanilla ice cream? I don't know. It's not a protected right. And what about Cherry Garcia ice cream? Does eating Cherry Garcia ice cream make me a communist? Our founding fathers were definitely clever. Instead of stating all the things that you should analyze, I'll provide you with a Bill of Rights compromise and state that you should analyze all relevant internal and external factors. What I'm really doing is forcing you to brainstorm what this means for each application of the Daddy Framework. After some thought, I am certain that you will create a better list of items to be further researched than I ever could predict in the pages of this book. For example, if you are utilizing the Daddy Framework to help start a federal government contracting company, some brainstorming outputs may be to analyze the following the legal requirements of starting a small business, the registration requirements necessary to bid on federal government contracts, your most marketable skills and capabilities to help shape your company's offered services or products, the government organizations with the largest budgets, the most helpful corporate discriminators, the available resources to support your small business, infrastructure requirements to comply with government regulations, and so on. We'll discuss these topics and many more later on in the book, so don't panic. Looking at these brainstorming outputs on paper, they seem obvious, if not intuitive. However, when you're looking at a blank sheet of paper, these intuitive items don't always seem to pop out. This is when tools like the five whys and the who, what, where, when, why, and how techniques are helpful. Once you start putting brainstormed ideas on paper, then you can start attacking them one by one. Remember, this is an iterative process. The more you learn, the more effectively you can do your analysis phase over again. Be warned, a little focus is required in the analysis phase to keep you from running down rabbit holes and wasting your time. Every bit of analysis should be direct tied to achieving your analysis phase end product, an effective problem statement. An effective problem statement is frequently the difference between tremendous success and horrible failure. Please recall the Apollo 13 movie starring Tom Hanks. The Apollo 13 space capsule suffers an in-flight catastrophe that places the crew at risk. All of NASA is working to bring them home safely. The culmination of NASA's entire focus occurs when the engineering leader empties a pile of miscellaneous items onto the table. He then provides one of the best problem statements in history. We have to find a way to make this a square piece fit into the hole for this a round piece using nothing but that, the stuff on the table. With a space capsule made of a billion parts Suffering an internal explosion, this geeky hero provided a concise problem statement that ultimately saved the lives of the Apollo 13 astronauts. This problem statement focused 
all emergency activities on a common defined goal. Now think about this. What if you came up with the wrong problem statement? What if NASA focused on solving a different problem? The astronauts would have died, turning a celebrated success into a tragedy. I can only imagine the magnitude of analysis that must have been performed to derive this problem statement. First, in a spaceship with a billion parts, he listed the requirement of a single piece fitting into the hole of another piece. He also listed the challenges and constraints, indicating the differently shaped pieces. Finally, he performed an internal analysis, identifying what the items they had to work with, the stuff on the table. This final bit about performing an internal analysis seems obvious in this example. In this case, internal analysis is represented by the physical items that were literally inside the spacecraft. However, internal analysis is typically more complicated and frequently overlooked. Throughout my naval and business careers, I have been involved with numerous process improvement efforts. Roughly half of these efforts were flawed from the very beginning. In developing their problem statement to correct a specific process deficiency, the project champion and stakeholders failed to perform even the most basic internal analysis. They assumed process inefficiency was the root cause of their performance concerns. However, I have learned to be skeptical. The first thing that I do in a process improvement effort is to analyze the current process very closely. Now, why would I waste my time carefully studying a flawed internal process that I'm asked to replace? There are two reasons for this. First, how do you know if your revised process is improving performance outcomes unless you have a performance baseline as a reference? Establishing a performance baseline is incredibly important to see if your process modifications are having the desired effects. The second reason drives my point home. A detailed analysis of the as-is situation is often more enlightening. In a high-tech economy that uses terms like big data, machine learning, and analytics as if they're common as in a freshman grammar class, the human element is frequently forgotten. Nearly always, the people performing the actual work are the most important sources of information. If you ask the right questions and truly listen to their responses, people will typically tell you what the challenges are. For half of these process improvement efforts, the finding that I reported was that no improvement was needed. What? As you can imagine, I got a lot of raised eyebrows. I will go on to explain, the process is not flawed, it's just not being followed. Instead of recommending process changes, I recommend quality assurance program modifications. Quality assurance assures that all the requisite programs, for example, training, audit, management oversight, and so on, are in place to ensure effective quality control. In layman's terms, Try following your existing internal processes before determining that they require changing. Again, without performing the appropriate internal and external analyses, an effective problem statement cannot be formulated. Please allow me to beat this dead horse. I cannot overstate the importance of an effective problem statement. The last thing that you want to do is spend your valuable time and resources solving the wrong problem. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it's much easier to do than you think. I'll give you an example that highlights a common mistake that most people make. Let's assume that you live in Northern Virginia suburbs and have grown to hate traffic like every good suburbanite does. Unfortunately, you spend an hour and a half commuting each way to work. Sadly, this is not uncommon in this area. Like many of your peers, you are considering moving, quote unquote, closer in to where you work. Although this may be a logical solution to a problem statement of shortening your drive to and from work, it is certainly a dramatic one that may have long lasting and unforeseen financial and social impacts on your family. For example, the cost of the move, new schools for your kids, and leaving old friends may negatively impact your quality of life more than the length of your commute does. 
This vague problem statement confuses stating a problem and presenting a solution. I propose that reducing commute distance is a knee-jerk solution and not a problem statement. In fact, reducing commuting distance is just one of many potential solutions to a broader solution type of reducing commute time where distance is just one variable. In addition to shortening your drive distance, other solutions in this broader category may include adjusting your commute time to avoid rush hour carpooling to use the less congested carpool lanes, and using the metro to avoid traffic altogether. I would suggest that your real problem statement is, how do I improve my quality of life impacted by my long hours away from my family due to my employment? My proposed problem statement not only includes solutions for shortening commute time, but it also includes other solution types, such as, telecommuting from home, working a compressed work schedule to limit the number of commuting days, and changing your job to a work site that is closer to home. Any one of these candidate solutions may be more desirable than moving quote-unquote closer in. Still a little vague? This example will make it crystal clear. A common form of torture that I experience daily is deciding what to make for dinner. My lovely and very helpful kids will frequently propose the following problem statement to help resolve this dilemma. What kind of cake should we have for dinner tonight? Admittedly, cake is a delicious solution type for our problem. However, Child Protective Services would probably want me to include other solution types as well. Confusing a solution type with your problem statement may tremendously limit your options. The strategy that I recommend is to start with a broad problem statement and use an iterative approach to narrow the problem statement during each iteration as you're able to eliminate candidate solution types. In my case, I started with the following problem statement. Find a way to better support my family while still providing for my family's daily needs using my current abilities, qualifications, network, and experiences. After my first iteration of detailed analyses, I determined that I needed to obtain my financial magic number to better support my family. I also determined that launching a company was the best solution type to my problem statement. My next iteration produced the following more focused problem statement. Determine and launch the best type of company to achieve my magic number financial goal while still providing for my family's daily needs using my current abilities, qualifications, network, and experiences. After another round of analysis, I determined that a federal government contracting company solution type was my best option. My final problem statement was sufficiently focused to move on to the next phase of the DADI methodology. It was define the best federal government contracting company service or product offering and launch a company that performs this offering to achieve my magic number financial goal while still providing for my family's daily needs using my current abilities, qualifications, network, and experiences. 